My name is Joey. Have the honor to be the lead pastor right here at the Block Church. And it's going to be a great, it's already been a great day, but it's going to be a great word, which is going to make us have an even great week. Amen. All right. Uh, well, I, listen, um, I, before I preach God's word, we're starting a new series today before I get into any of that. Uh, I actually all month long through October, I'm going to give you little updates on our Here to Stay uh, vision campaign. And I, I think you'll be really encouraged by these little updates. And I'll kind of give them to you sporadically. And uh, ultimately, it's been one year since we launched our Here to Stay Vision campaign. And so I just want to say to everybody who's participated, thank you so much. And uh, you're making a difference, which we're going to show you in a second. Also want to say it's not too late to get involved. Uh, uh, and, and Pastor Grace shot this video. She's going to explain everything in just a moment. But ultimately, here's the goal of Here to Stay. We just want to be able to revive every block forever. Yeah. And so being here to stay allows us to do that. And so Pastor Grace is going to share some of this, and then, then I'll preach God wor God's word. So at every location, why don't we take that away right now? Here to Stay is a two-year initiative that we launched in December of 2022. The goal is to raise additional funds beyond our normal budget to purchase or occupy strategic facilities that secure the future of our church and advance our mission to revive every block. So far, we have seen God work so many miracles through the Here to Stay campaign, and it's only been one year. We can see God's hand on our church and the movement of His Spirit in our neighborhoods. Last year, our Port Richmond location was still meeting in Richmond Hall and was feeling the pain of not having our own facility. Our lease at Richmond Hall was ending and the door was opening for us to purchase our very first facility in the Riverwards area. When we purchased the building last March for $825,000, we could only dream of how God would use it. After about $900,000 in renovations, we were able to move in in November of 2022. Now, because we own this building, our equipment lasts longer because it's not set up and torn down every week. This also increases the quality of life for our leaders. In the last 10 months, we've seen 144 new people come to Jesus and 75 people take the step to be baptized. Our Port Richmond location attendance has increased by 30% and our Espanol location has increased by 40%. Our youth ministry has grown by 42%, and we've seen 22 youth students say yes to Jesus, and nine youth students take the step to be baptized. All of these stats have names and faces, like Yaz Marie, a youth student who took a step to be baptized and has now stepped into a leadership role as creative coordinator at our Espanol location. And then there's Genesis, a single mom who rededicated her life to Jesus at our Port Richmond location and started the Block School of Leadership to discover her purpose within the local church. We've also been able to host events and be a resource to our neighborhood through their use of the building. We're able to do ministry beyond Sundays so that marriages get stronger, pastors can gather, and youth students can be developed. Simply put, more people are meeting Jesus in the Riverwards area because God provided a building and so many have said yes to living generously by committing to here to stay. We have prayed and watched as God has opened the doors for the Block Church to bless our community. And this is only the beginning. As we pursue a broadcast location, we still need $1.89 million in commitments and we're confident that we can do it together. We know that with a broadcast facility, our vision to revive every block will be stronger than ever as our dreams for it to be a hub for our communities and our other locations will fuel the message of the gospel here in Philadelphia. We can feel God moving in our church and through our communities. Will you say yes to God and be here to stay? Well, not awesome. Can we give God a praise for that? Great stuff. And again, you know, we're just not asking for additional dollars for fun or buildings to be, you know, to have something. We want to see people come to Jesus for the next 30, 40, 50, 100 years. We want to see students and kids transform. So anyway, if you want to get involved, you want to learn more, all you got to do is go to the next steps table at your lobbies or send us an email if you're online. We'd be happy to give you some more information. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, 
Uh, starting a brand new series today, uh, and it's called, It's Gonna Take All of Us, and we are studying the book of Haggai. Old Testament and a minor prophet. And you're, you're really going to love this series. And it's several weeks long. We're going to break it down. Today, I'm only giving you one verse. Okay, one verse. So you got homework. You're going to read your Bible this week. Okay. And, uh, but one verse today. But, but before I get into it, let me, I guess, let me explain where I'm going today uh, by describing to you a little bit of a method that I have on Saturdays. On Saturdays, I get very selfish, okay? Uh, I get a little selfish on Saturdays because, and I, I use this card all the time. This is my card. I gotta, I gotta preach tomorrow. I gotta preach tomorrow. And so, like, I, I, can't, do, I can't do the dishes. I have to preach tomorrow. I, I, can't, I, I can't watch the children for more than 10 minutes. I have to preach tomorrow. Like, it's gonna mess with my... My, my, my memory, you know, it's like, I, I can't do the laundry. Like, like what if the, the dust makes my allergies go like, like I, I got to preach tomorrow. And um, my wife, you know, worked a little bit early on, like, but, almost, but like 11 years in, no, it don't work. It don't work. Yesterday, uh, I was actually doing the laundry on Saturday. Um, yeah, you can give me a round of applause for that. Yeah doing the laundry on Saturday. And uh, my, my little daughter, Jovi, she's about two. I, I, I was like, you're gonna help me. Otherwise, because I can't find her all the time. She just runs away and she goes places and whatever. And so I'm handing her the laundry and she's putting it in the dryer and she's saying thank you every time. And I said, I said, daughter of mine, I said, this is how I want you to approach your chores every time. Thank you, <laughs> Father, for allowing me to do chores for you. So I'm doing a lot of great parenting. My book will come out in a few years. So. But I, I think a lot of times, a lot of us, what we do is we make up excuses uh, that are fake. We make up excuses uh, that sound spiritual. Okay, I gotta preach tomorrow. Well, so what, okay? Like I wrote my message earlier in the week, you know, like it sounds spiritual, but my wife needs help. You know what I mean? Uh, we, we do that though in a lot of areas of our life. We, we make excuses that sound spiritual. We justify so that we can move forward with our vision or with our inconveniences or excuse me, conveniences, right? So that, uh, so that uh, we feel better about ourselves and our lives. But, but, but honestly, too often, we make excuses when God wants to do something with us and use us. And, and so because we make excuses, because we don't want to extend the effort or inconvenience ourselves or whatever it means, what happens is, is we miss out on God's vision for our lives. And uh, this series, I, I actually want to help us collectively understand that each and every person it doesn't matter if you've been walking with Jesus for 10 minutes or 10 years. Each and every person who calls themselves a believer has a responsibility and an opportunity to make an impact in their city, in their sphere of influence, in their church. All of us called to build God's kingdom, all of us. But too often, we have our own personal vision and agenda that we want God to help us with rather than us coming alongside God and saying, what do you want for my life and for our church? And today I wanna to preach a message titled, Whose Vision? Whose Vision? Whose Vision? And I'm really tagging the thought from last week that I started a little bit where I said a lot of times uh, we're asking Jesus to follow us when we should be following Jesus. I'm gonna explore that further. And so whose vision, and, and when, it, when I say it's gonna take all of us, I, I legitimately mean that. Because, hear me on this, your impact as an individual is connected to your communal impact. And all of us have a, again, a responsibility and an opportunity to build God's kingdom 
It takes all of us to do it. And every person in this room who hears my voice, who's online, you matter. Your life matters. You make a difference. You can. Don't use excuses for God not to use you. This series is so important for your personal life. Even though it's about the community, it's so important for your personal life because it impacts where you will go. Every day and every season is a seed. You are sowing seed and you will reap that at some point in your life. I want to help you today. Whose vision? We're going to start. We're going to start at Ezra chapter three, verse 11. We're going to start at Ezra chapter three, verse 11. I know we're studying Haggai, but I got, I got to give you some context. Okay, the work of restoring the temple, the, the, if you will, our version of our church, okay? It starts here, and then I'll give you some context. Ezra 3, verse 11, with praise and thanksgiving, they, the people of God, sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation The foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Everybody say foundation. Foundation. Okay, the foundation is important. It's the altar, but it's, it's one part of it. I would say that over the last nine years, a foundation for what God wants to do in this city through us has been laid, but it's only the foundation. A little context here, okay? The book of Haggai, it's a prophecy from God to the Jewish people in Judah and Jerusalem and their response. The prophecy begins basically in September of 520 BC. This makes Haggai the first among the prophets after the exile. Okay, and so what happened was, is the people of God, they were exiled to Babylon. And then in a sense, 70 years later, they're allowed to go back. And in going back, and going back, they, a lot of people didn't go, but those who did were probably the most committed to the Lord. And they go back because God wants them to rebuild their pure civilization, their lifestyle of worshiping the Lord. Uh, the best way that I can liken it is when our founders of the United States, when they said, well, we want to go to a new land for religious liberties, Okay, that's the best way I can explain it. Our people, the God's people, excuse me, wanted to go back to their home to establish their freedoms rather than living under a pagan rule. Okay, that, that's really the context, okay? But in 538, okay, that's when they begin to go. Now, what I read you in Ezra is important, and I don't give you a little context that I'm gonna preach, is important because in a sense, they start it. But for 14 years, they do nothing. They start rebuilding God's house. And that's what they start with, by the way. And I want to say something. Listen to me. A lot of people, particularly in our culture, they live somewhere for a season. And then they, I got a job. I want to go somewhere else. I want a better opportunity. I want to go. I like the weather somewhere else. I'm tired of Philadelphia. You know, you give all these different things, right? And a lot of people will uproot themselves with no plan as to where they're going to go to church or what kind of spiritual covering they're going to have when they leave. I think that's dangerous. I would never move somewhere without understanding at least a realm of what my spiritual covering would be because my whole life is to build God's kingdom. And so the first thing that God asks them to do when they leave this Uh, under this pagan rule is uh, you need to establish my kingdom. You need to establish the temple because everything else should be built around that. And so, but they start, they start. But for 14 years, they do nothing. This is where I want to pick up Haggai chapter one, verse two. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. The people are saying, The people are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, it's interesting that God says to Haggai, the people versus my people. Have you noticed that? I thought it was fascinating. I had not read that before. God says the people, talking to Haggai, the people are saying it's not time to rebuild my house. Is God frustrated? Does God get frustrated? 
Yeah. We never like to hear God speak to his people this way, okay? He said this though, because listen to me, their excuses and their poor priorities were not reflective of what his people should be doing. We, we can't, we cannot sit here and say we are Jesus followers if Jesus' priorities are not at the top of the list of our lives. And so many of us, I love you, but so many of us are literally trying to just survive and get through life and holler at Jesus so that you make it into heaven, but not bring heaven to earth. So many of us are, are literally like, okay, like Jesus is, you remember that old shirt, Jesus is my homeboy. They had the hats and everything. Like, like well, a lot of us, we just, we're, I'm cool with Jesus. But like, that's not good enough. It's not. Like, like my life must be consumed by my maker, by my savior. That's what living for God is all about. And the Lord is frustrated because in a sense, he feels, in a sense, and this is the best way I can describe it from a human standpoint, God feels used. Are you really my people? Are you just using me to get into heaven, to get my blessings? Are you just using me to, to, to get out of captivity? Or Like, who am I to you? Now, I want to reiterate something. These people were not bad people. Okay, they were the remnant that returned from Babylon. Hundreds of thousands of people went into the Babylonian captivity and only about 50,000 returned. Those who did were the most committed to the Lord and to the restoration of Jerusalem. I, I want to also say something that we do have this. We do have this weird narrative in in political subculture that nations and that um, and that your own people, if you will, aren't important, and that's just not true. There's a difference between unhealthy uh, pride and healthy responsibility for where God has planted you. Some people take their national pride too far, uh, but some people don't have any pride for where they live. And I, I think you have to understand something that it is important for us, for believers, to have an element of national care. God puts you in your soil, in your city. My Lord, you should love your city despite all of her flaws. <laughs> Okay, and, and, like, and, and we should seek the welfare and the goodness of the places that God has put us. We have to. We should be making the areas that God planted our feet better. And so God creates this thing like his nation, his people of Jerusalem to show us that God wants the subculture of the kingdom to be pure and righteous. And then that impacts culture everywhere we go. And, and so when you see these people return to Jerusalem, they, they want to come and they want to establish a holy ground of God's glory so that anyone who comes or wherever they go, there's an element of God's goodness within and without Blessed coming in, blessed going out. Ultimately, though, God's people, the citizens of Jerusalem, they told themselves that this isn't yet time to resume work on the temple. And there were some good reasons, though, why they might say this and why the work of rebuilding the temple was hard. The land was still desolate after 70 years of neglect. The work was hard. They didn't have a lot of money. We'll get to that. Or manpower or at least they claimed they didn't. They suffered crop failures and drought. We'll get to that. Hostile enemies resisted the work. 
They remembered, listen to this, they remembered easier times in Babylon. Because of the great obstacles against the work, God's people began to rationalize and decided that it wasn't time to rebuild after all. If it's so hard, evidently, God doesn't want us to do this or at least anytime soon. That is what they were saying. If it is so hard, then surely God doesn't want us to do this. I want to ask you a couple questions today. How many times do we say God's vision is too hard? I am a master at this, especially when I go around other pastors, I kind of just accumulate this victim mentality where I'm like, man, God's vision's so hard. And I get, I go super Eeyore, you know, Winnie the Pooh. But like the reality is, this is a common, and this is really where I want to help you in your personal life. This is a common misconception that believers experience. Something is hard, so it must not be God. It's not smooth, so it's not God. I don't have peace, so it can't be God. I think you're looking for false peace. I want to go to John chapter 6, verse 53, first part of 56 through 60. Jesus said to them, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus talking. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, verse 60, on hearing it, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? In other words, a lot of the people, like like in one day, it'd be like if I got up here and I preached a message and I know it was right from God, but half of you or 75% of you left because you didn't like what I said. Oh, that's too hard. That happens sometimes, by the way. Not at that volume. And, and, and the disciples are like, Jesus, chill out, man. We're going to lose everybody. We, we got to keep the seats full. We got we to keep, keep the money flowing, you know? And, and that's, a, a, that's absolutely a tendency and, a, and a, a thing that pastors especially have to guard against. I don't want to say too much. I, I don't want to be too hard. I, I don't want to give the full counsel of God. I don't want to tell the full truth because, man, what if somebody doesn't like it? What if somebody doesn't leave? What if, they, where's, what if the money dries out? All this stuff, right? Because the reality is, is, the, is what the scriptures teach at times is hard. Yeah. And I just got to remember, it's my responsibility to give you the truth in love and, and let the chips fall where they may. But the same thing that was happening then is happening now because they're like, Jesus, chill out, man. This is too hard. And he's like, if you don't eat my flesh, drink my blood, you can't have any part of me. In other words, what he's saying is, is guys, if you're not all in on me and my priorities, love you, but there's the door. Because where we're going, you got to be all in. And it will take all of you saying, I want all of him. Who can accept God's vision? The people who accept it are those who hear his voice and receive him. Those who are his, even when it's difficult, even when it goes against our natural tendencies and our own vision. Many years ago, I was listening to this preacher and uh, he was sharing about how God gave him an idea to write a book. And he said, so I asked my wife if I could go away to this hotel for three days and uh, God just downloaded it and I finished the book in three days. Well, around that time, I was sensing that I, God was calling me to write a book and uh, you can pick it up anywhere. It's called Level Up and uh, you've probably read it already. And, well, and, so, and so I was like, yes, I'm going to do that. Lord, I need to go away for three days because I'll just knock out the book. Well, I went away for three days and God 
was, was using AOL or something like that. Like the download speed was super slow. And, and I only got through like the introduction. And I was like, this is kind of hard. Also, I don't like that preacher no more. And I'm like, God, that's messed up, man. Like, why do you do stuff for other people? I felt like you told me to do this. And all of a sudden, this is hard. Maybe this isn't from you, God. Maybe this isn't your will, God. Well, nine months later, I finally did complete that book. And when I got the darn thing in the mail, you know this, the front cover was spelled wrong. Could have killed somebody. But I'm thankful that we went through it. We figured it out. I've been really encouraged by some of the fruit of that work. What, what I learned though is, is that the book was more about what God was doing in me than it was me doing something for somebody else. And a lot of times when we follow God's vision for our life, it's really about what God ends up doing inside of you than for everybody else. Everybody else is impacted, but it's like God transforms you. Here's the problem. We compare our experiences with others and we gain a false sense of peace looking at their lives and looking at their process. There's nothing wrong with aspiring to other people's successes, but our experiences and what God has given us to do has to be for what God has given us to do. And we have to accept our timeline, not somebody else's. So listen to me, stop wishing for someone else's vacation, stop wishing for somebody else's marriage, stop wishing for somebody else's lifestyle, stop wishing for somebody else's house, money, job, or anything in between, because just because it's easy doesn't mean it's God. Just because it isn't easy doesn't mean it isn't God. False peace is when you feel good about something that isn't good for you. Wow. Let's process that. False peace is when you feel good about something that isn't good for you. Just because it's easy, just because it's better. We sang it today. The grass ain't greener on another mountain. It's where God has called you. Eventually, you will experience the blessing of God where you plant your feet. And Haggai, they said, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The people, listen to me, the people made their excuse sound spiritual. They couldn't speak against the idea of building the temple, so they spoke against its timing. They said, it isn't God's timing to rebuild the temple. Another question I wanna ask you, do you make your excuses sound spiritual? Do you make your excuses sound spiritual? The people lacked faith in prioritizing what God wanted, so instead they tried to manipulate the situation and God. Friends, listen to me. It is very easy for us to try and manipulate God. Because naturally, we're so good at manipulating each other. Thankfully, God's not going to be mocked. And he always knows the heart. And when we sense God is saying something and we say, no, God, it's not your time. When it is his time, what we're doing is we're making excuses that sound spiritual. And we're trying to manipulate the situation. John 5, verse 3, and then 8 through 10. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. Verse eight, Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. So in other words, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they had strict laws about the Sabbath, can't move, can't work, can't do anything. 
And by the way, the Sabbath is built for you. You should still observe it, but it's more about a spiritual and emotional rest and trust in God than it is you getting in your car and driving to Wawa to get some milk. Okay, however, what's happening here is that it is an obvious example of what the pharisaical spirit does. It was time for Jesus to heal that person, but they used an excuse that sounded spiritual so they could stay in control. We do it. We break up with somebody, we blame it on God. No, just didn't like them. Thought they were ugly. They're crazy. That's why you date, you figure it out. Some of us, we don't give. We say there's no room in the budget or finances, yet we say God wants me to thrive. It's not time yet. We don't serve within the church or outside of it because, well, God wants me to care about myself, self-care. But that's not caring for yourself when you're not giving yourself out. Some say, I don't have to attend church because I can connect with God anywhere. I I can be the church anywhere. Well, that's true, but it's also not true. It's deception. It's misplaced. You need both. Some say, I got to be a good neighbor, but then I enable sin. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, talking about David, for I've rejected him, not David, but the others. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them, ready? People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We have to be honest about our motives or we will never acquire or execute God's vision for our lives. I'm trying to get you honest as to where you are at in your life. God's vision, your vision. Who's gonna win? So what is God's vision for our life? I wanna ask you that question. What is God's vision for your life? Well, this is a broad question. One in which I've, I've answered before, okay? So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, okay? But I'm gonna give you four quick things, super quick, okay? Every Christian is meant to know and love God. That should be your pursuit every day I wake up. Thank you, Lord, for this day. I wanna know you more. I open up the scriptures. Who is Jesus? Help me become more like him. What is Paul saying about the instructions for living? Like, I wanna know you, God. Walk with me and I with you. I'm a follower. I'm a disciple. The second one is, as I exist to worship God. And worshiping God is any and all aspects of your life. Colossians tells us, whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. When you go to work, how you act is worship. You're either worshiping yourself, the enemy, or God. I'm worshiping God. Yes, I'm singing songs. That's great. That's part of it. This is a pep rally on Sundays. Okay? But how I live my life Monday through Saturday, that's the true measure of worship. I exist to worship God. Number three, I exist to reach people. Evangelize. Want to always encourage you. You should always be bringing people to church. Always invite them. Don't waste God's resources on those invite cards. But also, nobody's stopping you from evangelizing, listening to the Holy Spirit, reaching your waiter and waitress and flight attendant and coworker, and you can do it right where you're at. Number four, we're meant to build his church. 100%. This is, this is the mandate of the believer. I'm making disciples. I'm becoming a disciple. I'm part of this community and I'm doing all I can to elevate his church, his kingdom, where God has placed me both with the small C, the local church, the block church, and with the big C, the global church, as we participate in building church plants and reaching our city. We exist to make God's name great wherever God's planted us. But the series begs the question, it's gonna take all of us. So I wanna answer this question today. And I know that I, and I get this because when I, when I do series like this or when I begin to talk about building the church, I know it's tempting for many people to be subconsciously go, oh, this series is not about me and my personal life the whole time. I'm not coming. So uh, they're not, they're, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not learning, uh, you know, about all the ways that I can be a, a great person, have the best life now, so I'm gonna stay home. 
I know that's not what we say, but sometimes subconsciously, it's just like, this isn't for me. But, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that if you call yourself a Christian, there is a communal responsibility that brings out the best in your individual life. When we build God's church, when we build God's house, it builds your life. So what is God's vision for our church? What is God's vision for our church? Well, I remember when we named our church, and I'm almost done, so I know you're getting antsy. Yeah, that's where you say, no, pastor. We actually would like you to teach for two hours all day like they did in the early church. No, 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 just a couple minutes. It's okay, thank you. I remember when we named our church early on and everyone was like, what? The black church? <laughs> yes, but also <laughs> the black church. <laughs> it's funny how one letter can change everything. Uh, I was texting somebody the other day and literally an accidental one letter will change everything. But we've always had this vision, listen to me, to represent our city and our region and be in every neighborhood. Here's our vision. This is why we've done here to stay because we wanna be able to revive every block. That's it. Gotta be here to stay so we can revive every block. Our vision to revive every block, the block church, what does it mean? Here's the first one. We exist to seek Jesus, to seek him, to know him, to become more like him. We're passionate believers to, to be in love with Jesus because he was first in love with us, to seek him, to know him, to worship him, to give him glory for our life. I want to know Jesus, Christ and Christ crucified. I want my life to be defined with our Jesus people. I want that for you, man. It will change everything. I want to live a life full of forgiveness and full of faith and uh, full of grace and love. And my, I'm seeking Jesus. And together we will too. The second one is, is we start locations. All these have an S for your remembrance. Revive every block. We seek Jesus. We start locations everywhere and anywhere that God leads us in our city and in our region. Friends, we already have a hundred ideas of places we're going and we wanna go next. Through here to stay, we have sensed God say, pause. We want to establish some long-term strategic facilities, whether it be long-term rentals or, our, or owning. Particularly, we're working on and continuing to work on a broadcast facility that will be large for our whole church to gather and be impacted in when needed and also to continue to grow and be a mothership so that we can keep planting and launching locations, which as and when that happens, then we'll go back to the drawing board and start locations again, which I can't wait to do. It kills me that we're not starting locations, but I know God has asked us to pause right now to establish long-term health so that we can keep reviving every block in the future. Third one is we exist to strengthen our communities. Man, I'm gonna share so many cool, I got some great stories for next week about how we exist to strengthen our communities. It's not just serve Saturdays, although that's important. It's not just serving on Sundays, all oh, that's important. It's not just serving your neighbor. Collectively, when, we, we, when, when the church exists, it strengthens its communities when the church does what Jesus has called the church to you. What's God's vision for us? That's it. Revive every block. I'm just a couple minutes over, but I, I want to tell you a story to close today. And thank you for staying with me. I know it was a lot of teaching today. It'll be, be a little more preaching next week. I know you love that. Last week, I was, um, I was preaching down in Center City and uh, if you ever miss church in the morning, it, it's a great location to be at. Obviously, they've got a great community down there. But I was down at Center City. I was preaching, and I was doing the response at the end, which we do every week. Anyone want to know Jesus? And this young man, his hand shoots up. and Service ends, and I'm hanging out, and people are talking. And uh, one of the prayer people says, you got to come hear this story. got to come hear this story. And so I stand before this young man who begins to share his story. And... 
I was so moved because he said the night before, I was just like so overwhelmed, like, God, you're not real. He has been homeless, overwhelmed, broken, depressed, has been suicidal, all these different things. And the night before, he's just like, like God, I, I, I don't think the church will accept me, uh, but I got to know, like, if you're real, I'm not sure I believe, but if you're real, give me a sign. The next day, he stumbles upon us online. So I want to say shout out to all of those who work on broadcasts and our online ministry because you never know who it's going to impact. It's why it's powerful when you serve on those teams, production, broadcast. Anyway, I digress. So he's like, I, I, was, I, I saw this message and he's like, I, and I'm just watching it by random. Uh, oh my goodness, like this is for me. I think he's talking to me. And he's like, I wish I could go and then realize we had an evening service. And so end up getting to the evening service. Here's the same message, but it's just so moved. And at that moment, raises his hand to give his life to Jesus. And he's talking after, he's like, can I be here? Is this real? Does God really love me? And I'm like, bro. And so I'm giving him this hug and I'm going like, this is the end zone. Like, this is what it's all about. God, you can have everything. You can have my time. You can have my resources. You can have my life. Because like if it gets us that, where somebody whose life has transformed and changed, a community different, like this is why I'm here. This is why you are here. For the person who hasn't yet been rescued. Church, don't ever forget where you've been rescued from. It will take all of us to rescue our city, but it's God's vision. Will you say yes to his vision?